when I wrote the abstract for this talk, of course, uh, I didn't really know what I would be able to actually talk about. So I promise to explain to you for whom and to do what the science of sound was uh, developed in the 17th century. And that turns out to be a really simple question which can be answered right here in like three minutes. Basically it was developed for um, princes and other ruling people in order to be able to speak to everybody, to be heard by everybody, to hear what everybody says and not to be heard themselves when they don't want to be heard. So basically if it was about that you could just all leave, was problem solved. Um, other things in the abstract are kind of more complicated and I hope to actually know about them by now but I found out that I won't be able to answer those questions, basically those about how 17th century ideas about privacy influence or maybe stuck around to become our ideas about privacy and how these things, yeah, what stuck or what didn't stuck. That turns out to be really complicated and if you hope to actually learn the answer to that, you could probably leave now as well because I won't be able to give it to you. So what I'm actually going to do is to rather describe and show you how this 17th century sci science of sound and surveillance looked like and felt like and what the driving ideas behind it were. That starts not in the 17th century but slightly before what the ideas of sound actually, what? What? That wasn't me. <laughs> There I am again. Okay, this is probably the slide that's going to be on the longest, so it shouldn't reappear as a problem. Whatever. Mm. Yeah, but it's not my machine, so I'm kind of like, what the hell? Okay. Now that was too much wiggling. So the 17th century starts where the 16th century stops and in the 16th century there were basically two ideas of what sound is. One is one that is kind of uh, common to us as an explanation. Basically you throw a stone into water and then there's ripples on the surface and sound is like that only in the air. That sounds really modern and that sounds like they actually had an idea of what a sound wave is, but it's not. This is just a very simple picture they used. They had no idea about, I mean this is basically a two dimensional wave thing and they had no idea what it's like to have a, a, a sound wave that's actually more like a sphere going out in all directions in space. And no concept of pressure and pressure changes and what that means, so it seems like a, a wave theory of sound, but really it's not. <laughs> and the second one, which was a bit more uh, developed at the time, was that whatever sounds or emits sound actually emits little tiny copies of itself called species and that these species travel through um, space and reach the nerves and the imagination and from there comes the idea of um, the tone we, he we hear. That's an idea that was actually taken from optics where also like what you see is basically a tiny, tiny version of the object you're seeing that has reached your eye. Um, that theory doesn't make sense on a lot of levels, basically because it doesn't explain perspective or why things look uh, bigger when they're closer and it's also in, in sound is kind of a makeshift option. It's like what you used to describe it if you don't really know how to go about it. And apart from these two ideas, a very important influence of 17th century acoustics and science in general was um, the notion of natural magic. Uh, we have it from this guy, or not just this guy, but he wrote a book that 
It's titled Magia Naturalis. And no, that was one too much. Ach. Nee. Here. Um, and the notion of natural magic basically says that nature is made up from lots of hidden occult forces and these forces they are not really supernatural they are natural hence natural magic but they are hidden and mysterious and um, it's if, if you find out about them you can do wonderful things with them so it's an idea about power as well and certain devices that astonish or surprise are also part of this whole notion of natural magic because when you produce something wonderful, a wonderful effect by making use of these hidden forces in nature that other people don't know about, um, then you produce a magical device which can entertain or whatever. But, so magic is a very different thing than what it would be for us today now. And it's also a thing that's very close to experimental science because it's both about finding out about these hidden forces in nature and about um, making use of them and applying them to produce devices that do something surprising, which means you have to understand how they work exactly. Uh, one of these devices, which was often used for, let's say, shows of natural magic, was uh, a pair of vibrating strings. Because you have this phenomenon where one string, when it is tuned exactly to the same uh, tone as the other, will, will also sound and vibrate if you um, make, you know, pick one and it sounds and then the other will sound. And this is wonderful because, wonderful or magical, because there's no apparent uh, influence, nothing obvious happening between the one string and the other string. You just sound one and the other will sound as well. And it's kind of hard to make out why if you're a 17th century person. Um, so this is really important point to stress that these vibrating strings, this is a magic that actually works. If you think in the mindset of the time, you can actually prove that magic works. Uh, of course, this... Uh, this whole vibrating string thing got adapted by scientists later on who were very much thinking that they were above magic and were better than magic. And the first of them was probably, uh, or the first in my talk to appear at least, is uh, Francis Bacon, who drew up this grand program of what experimental science is supposed to be, or could be, and what it could do. And he also happened to uh, paint a grand picture of what the science of sound, which didn't really have a set name by yet, uh, could actually make and he uh, described uh, superior people in one of his books that had perfected this science of sound and which could produce wonderful tones and sweet tones and magical echoes which would come back at you louder than you actually spoke and which could uh, change the sounds you make and break them and also uh, devices to improve hearing and lots of great things, but he never actually did much of it. So he said, well, somebody, you know, should do this sometime and then stuff will be wonderful, but um, he wasn't the one to actually do it. Now, the science that he described, he said it would be a superior natural magic. He knew De La Porta and um, he overtook many of the things that De La Porta wrote, like whole passages and experiments and stuff that crop up in Bacon are actually taken from De La Porta's Magia Naturalis. But he was very fond of making a distinction between him and De La Porta and saying that, well, I'm going to do this right. This um, Bacon 
he was still just a little bit of background. I mean, he was a person at court, and in a way, you could say maybe a court magician. So one of his roles was to keep the king, the English king, entertained by uh, coming up with strange things and experiments to look at. One of them, probably the vibrating string. Yeah. Now, the first person to actually put into practice what Bacon wanted to have done was uh, Mr. Massen, Marin. I don't know how his first name is actually pronounced, but what? Marine, Marine probably, could be. Yeah, <laughs> Marin, okay. Um, at the time, he was like the one person scholarly journal, because if you wanted uh, to have some fact or some discovery known at the time, you would just uh, write a letter to uh, Mr. Mersenne, and he would write letters to everybody he knew, and he knew lots and lots and lots of people, and that's how a new fact would become known. He would also uh, do lots of experiments himself, and he was a mat mathematician as well, and one of the experiments he did was to uh, span a strong rope, a really thick, strong rope, and long one too. Don't ask me about the numbers. Um, and make it vibrate, and with a sound that he could actually still identify. And the sound was so deep that he could actually, or he thought he could, uh, count the vibrations by his, like, just with his eyes. So he was the first person to have a pretty good grasp of the idea of uh, absolute frequency, so that it's not just the length of the strings you can ma measure or the width, but that, it's re that you really know, okay, this tone is vibrating so and so often per minute or second or whatever it is you want. Um, he would also, he would also measure the speed of sound. He was one of the first. I mean, Bacon proposed a way, you know, you could measure the speed of sound if you did this and that, but Mersenne actually did it in a very strange way because, I mean, we're in a time before there are really precise clocks. So it's not just like pressing on a timer and saying, now is it over or something? But he did it with echo. He um, went to a place where there was a strong echo and he knew where it was coming from. And he found uh, a word, I think it was benedictum. And he said that word and he just said benedictum, benedictum, benedictum. And he would note the syllable by which the first version of it came back to him. And then he would try to, he would try to find the distance between where he, he himself repeatedly saying benedictum, benedictum, benedictum would be exactly attuned to the echo coming back. And from that he could say, okay, benedictum, if I say it, it takes me so long to say it, I'm so far away from the wall. And he got an approximate yeah, value for speed of sound, which changed quite a bit from experiment to experiment. But So that was the first idea too actually put into practice measuring the speed of sound. Now, Mersenne was very much anti-magic, and he was very much um, trying to use the new notion of experimental science as a way to fight heretics, because he thought that science could give such security and proof that there would be no place for heretical thoughts anymore, which was the reason why he liked it so much. And the joke in this is that Mr. Mersen himself would probably be described as pretty magical and esoteric by anyone looking at him today. Uh, his main book about uh, music and sound was called Harmonie Universelle, and it really meant that he still believed in a very harmonically ordered universe, where everything was uh, measured in, in harmonical uh, ratios. The only difference really was that 
he said the old natural magicians, they thought they could, uh, they knew the harmonies in the universe before they even looked, and therefore they are wrong. But I'm just, you know, I know there are harmonies in the universe because I looked first, and that's why I'm right. Now, one of these uh, harmonies still has to do with a vibrating string, because uh, he first had an idea that consonance isn't actually caused by harmonical numerical ratios, so it's not that you know the octave is uh, one to two in, in the length of the string or what you take, and that it's because it's one to two that it sounds nice to our ears, but he developed this theory that there are sound particles or air particles um, all vibrating in, in this frequency and that when they coincide on the ear in this relationship um, or in small relationships, that, that is what sounds uh, nice to our ears. This isn't, in, in practice, it doesn't make much of a difference which theory you adopt. Um, it's just that he's still about the string and it's still harmonical and the universe is still full of wonderful things and mysterious things to find out. Uh, now, the last person, or no, the, the second to last person I'm going to talk about, um, this guy, Athanasius Kirche, he in turn, I mean, we've seen by now, uh, Bacon took over stuff from De La Porta, uh, Marin Marcin took uh, uh, stuff uh, from Bacon, and Kirche copied just large parts from Marcin, really a lot from Marcin. He uh, basically wrote whole chapters and sections of his books just translating Marcin from French into Latin. Um, one of these books was the Musuria Universalis, which was more or less a yeah, version of Mersenne's Harmonie Universelle with lots more stuff thrown in that Kirche thought was interesting. And the second one was the Fonogia Nova. A little bit later, um, 1673, where about now? And this is probably the first book to actually exclusively deal with acoustics. This one uh, was a bit earlier, 1650. So in this time, acoustics kind of became a discipline of its own. Before it was thrown in with a music mostly, what a tone was and what sound was, it wasn't, yeah. And now Kirche is a very, very strange person. Kirche was a Jesuit, he was uh, working in Rome. And he was a friend of Mersenne's, one of these people who got lots of letters from Mersenne about new stuff, but Kirche also became lots of letters from all the Jesuits that were uh, traveling the world and trying to find out what is actually going on in, on these other continents that are still fairly new, and in China and wherever. So he gets a lot of incoming information, and he thinks he's able to or he tries to bring it all into a form to make beautiful books from that would be entertaining to his patrons and would make sense of this mess of new information coming in. Because Kirche was very much dependent on patronage. He was not a nobleman himself. He, was, uh, he needed always someone with lots of money and power to be able to just print his books because they would pay the printer. And he was also the guy responsible for the first museum in Rome. So it, the museum, it wasn't a public institution like it would be now, but the museum of the Jesuits, it was kind of a place to go to where strange things were collected and there could be um, devices, that could be stones, that could be plants from other continents. And Kirche would sometimes uh, receive visitors and show them around and explain to them what was what. And these visitors were often noble people, usually noble people. I mean, you needed to be somebody to get into there because not public. Um, 
so he actually had use for many acoustical, wonderful playthings. Some of them, and it doesn't always become clear which, one, which ones he actually built and which ones he only dreamt up. Um, well, some of them were about using echo. Now, maybe you will pick up why this idea, how to build walls so you can get multiple echoes would not have worked. Um, the thing is, if you actually want to get something like that, that the distance you have to have between the first and the second wall, so you notice actually that it's two echoes and not just one, is so big that it would have been hard at the time to actually produce a sound that is loud enough in the beginning to travel, you know, there and then there and then back again and actually keeping it apart. So this is a nice idea in theory, but apparently not one of the ones he built himself because no, couldn't have worked. Um, this is one of the few instances where he actually found out something that nobody had known before and that he got right. This explains how um, in a building where you have one space where you can talk and another space rather far away where it sounds like the person talking is just standing right beside your side uh, functions. Basically, you have an elliptical form and these lines of reflection are pretty accurate. Uh, he also noticed that for sound reflecting purposes, you don't have to be as precise as for uh, light reflecting purposes, but he didn't really make a, I mean, of course he didn't really know what um, like wavelength, what it actually means and why it is that way, so he just noted it. But um, This is an idea for a speaking trumpet or a speaking tube, where you get a visualization of the sound ray this actually worked, and still works, I mean, it's just a megaphone, basically. But the thing about Kirche is, in 1673, he was claiming that he was the guy who invented it, which is not true. But you could see the whole uh, Fonogia Nova as a big, big book just to strengthen this claim of his that he was a guy who invented this whole sound art devices thing. Um, this is how he explained the horn of Alexander the Great. Because apparently there's a story about Alexander the Great that he had a big horn through which he could uh, communicate with his whole troops. And now Kirche set about to think about, okay, if he had this, I mean, Alexander, big troops. So, big horn. And what would have worked the best? Now, Kirche believed that sound was strengthened with each reflection. So, the more reflection you get, the stronger the sound comes out of the horn, which is why he, in the end, uh, says that it couldn't have been a straight cone like a megaphone, but instead it would have been something like this circular, uh, bended thing because there's more reflection in there. This, of course, is completely not true and very, very strange. Yeah, very, very wrong. And he does claim that he has experimented with this and knows that it has to be right. So it's kind of, yeah. Um, this is another story that he tries to explain uh, of a tyrant in classical Greece who had uh, his palace up there and his captives down uh, like in the basement or rather in these grottoes down there and there were channels up and the claim was that the tyrant was able to hear what his, cap what his captives were talking. And there is a grotto and place in, in Greece where they think this uh, might have been or that it is the source of the story. And, well, the thing is that the grotto produces lots of uh, reverb. So whatever you say, whatever you do, it makes a big noise. But in the place up uh, on the mountain, you cannot 
you cannot understand a word because it just all gets warped and you cannot m make out any sense of the noises coming from downtown, uh, from down there. It's just, yeah. But Kircher believed in it and um, he thought he could have, you know, he himself could have made it work, which is, of course, a kind of promise and way to uh, tell the people who are giving him his money to print his books, hey, I um, can do really great things for your palace and maybe you want to listen in on your captives. I'm going to tell you how. Um, yeah, this is one of the most absurd diagrams that I've found in the whole book. I wasn't completely able to make out what it is about because the Anacephaleosis Magia Naturalis, Magia Naturalis is actually a, a chapter about how to make um, a talking statue. So it could be that in the upper room where A is, there is imagined to be a statue which is uh, talking or which is making the sounds that are coming from outside. It could also be that in this room A is somebody who's trying to listen in, in who is in the room E. I honestly don't know. Big horn, and you have to put your really big horn out the window, and we hear it. Yeah, but then why is the ray going down back to the other window, which is closed anyway? But <laughs> <laughs> sheer genius. <laughs> well, most of these pictures actually exist in in two versions because the stuff from the Fonogia Nava in '73 is much recycled material from the Mosulia from 1650. But, so this is from 1650, and in the respective part from 1673, he's left it out, so maybe he wasn't so sure what it was about <laughs> either anymore anyway. So, um, yeah, and now it becomes a bit more concrete with the whole, uh, who's actually doing the talking here. Because this is one of the ideas for people to talk in private, in secrecy. And every time he describes a device like this, which is, of course, again, meant to be elliptic, um, he just talks about princes. Princes who might want to converse in private. That's the idea. Um, they look very strange. Um, there's a second version. I mean, this guy, is, you know, his eyes are like... <laughs> And again, he thinks that um, this kind of bended thing would be much more effective than the simple elliptic thing, which would actually work at least a little bit as we know today. But yeah, so that's the idea. Um, this is again the, the later version. I, it's not really obvious from the text if he thinks that at the side of this table, there are other people who are not supposed to know what the two people at the head ends are talking. It could be. Um, it also, I mean, the, the sentence says that uh, the, the second version, which is more like, like the inner ear, that it was uh, built at the, like, like in nature, like, like, yeah, that nature was the example of it, and that for that reason, it has a wonderful force of uh, collecting and collecting sound. So apparently he was so sure that this bended thing works better because it looks like the inner ear, or more like the inner ear. And yeah. Now this is the big version between houses. And again, we're not talking about houses, but the text is very clear that this is to be built between palaces. Now, we are in Rome. So, Rome, you have lots of bishops and, and noblemen from all over Italy who try to be important by being in, you know, the papal city and many, many really rich people doing many conspiracies and intrigues and stuff. So, there are actually many palaces in the city. It's not a one palace, it's not just that you have this one important person and this one big palace, but yeah, 
many rich people, many important people, many palaces, and apparently they want to talk to each other, or he thinks they want to talk to each other. This is the extended version, again, to make the claim that the uh, Ben thing down there would uh, work best. I have no idea how he thought that anything like this could actually be built in a distance where it would be useful. But he was very sure that these things work. And he also, I mean, there, there's one description of an experiment he did which uh, I think can be believed. Uh, and that was to take one of these conical tubes and put it on top of a church steeple and by that device call all the people in the parish to come to church, come to mass. So, but that wasn't built and it was a much smaller scale than anything he proposes here and, well. Yeah, well, it's not just, it's not just, we're coming back to the point where natural magic and science in this time are actually also part of entertainment. So here he is not only telling his prince that, you know, you can do this useful secret communication thing with me and I'm going to tell you how to talk to your troops, but he's also suggesting that by building something like this, you could have a band of musicians play in one room and, well, just transmit the music somewhere else, wherever you want to have it. Um, the second version of this picture is uh, this, where it's much more specific where the music is to be transmitted to. So, in the upper right corner, there's again the prince, who now doesn't have to put up with the presence of lowly musicians anymore in order to enjoy his music. Yeah, they kind of have the role of the captives in this grotto a bit. But, I mean, it's the same idea. It's, this is a bit confusing, but the second version tells it better. This one. Now, this is probably the picture where I thought, well, maybe there's a topic about surveillance and stuff in here, because the idea is clearly the prince sits in the middle room and he just hears everything that is said in his palace. And this reminded me very much of the idea I had read in uh, Foucault about the uh, Panopticon of Bentham, which is about 100 years later. The idea, not the praxis. The idea in the Panopticon is that you have, this is, well, how it looks if somebody would build it in the 20th century, you have this tower in the middle where somebody is sitting, or not, you don't ever really know, and he can watch everything the inmates in these uh, cells do, because here we are talking about inmates. It's an idea for, um, for a prison, basically. Now, the parallel, of course, is that you have one guy who cannot be heard or cannot be seen, who's listening or seeing everything all the other people say or do. But it turns out that these ideas are completely different. They are so, so very different that it's hard to speak of surveillance in, in this version at all. It's not really... So, what are the differences? One of the differences, apart from the whole here we have listening, there we have seeing thing, is that in the first instance we have surveillance just of the people who are in the prince's palace. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be there, it doesn't say if they're inmates or if they're just passing through. And in the Panopticon, we have inmates who really have to be there. And they cannot talk to each other. In the palace, the whole point of the device is to listen in on what the people are talking to each other. That means the people are in contact. They can move around freely. In the Panopticon, they can't. They're just one person per cell and there's no conversation, there's no... So, the prince, the listening in that he does, is kind of more personal. 
it's this whole idea of intrigue in this important city where he always has to uh, be afraid of somebody making a conspiracy against him, maybe even his own trusted people. And this is a point that is of no interest whatsoever in the Panopticon. Uh, the Panopticon is less about people, of course it's not at all about people plotting to do wrong, and more about people doing things properly, so that they're not lazy, that they're not misbehaving, that they're doing what, they're, what they should do, where in the Panacousticon, how it could be called, in the palace, it's just about listening in if they do something they should not do. It's not really, it doesn't care about if they do things right or not. It's just, if there's danger coming, then the prince wants to know. Um, so the prince is more a paranoia thing where the panopticon is, of course, what it's known for, a discipline thing. The prince's palace device can obviously also use for entertainment and not just if there's musicians playing, but also maybe the prince is just bored and wants to know what's going on. But, you know, a prince cannot just go down there and talk to common people. It's so maybe, maybe he's just lonely and bored and wants to know what's going on. While in the Panopticon, there's, I mean, the form of it derived from certain forms of entertainment in the 18th century where you have a big picture and you go there and, and it's a picture that just goes around uh, 36, uh, 360 degrees and, and you think you're kind of entrapped in this world. But the Panopticon in this form isn't designed really for anybody to have pleasure in it or to be, you know, used as a pleasure device. Uh, at least it's not admitted, but it's a very strange form of pleasure if you have pleasure from it. Um, what? For example, but... But you can't watch the people do anything interesting. It's not like you're, you know, watching them doing anything private. You're just watching them being alone by themselves, not being allowed to do anything. And that's also if you're a pervert as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Other kind of pervert. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, and there are also very different ideas about uh, government and ruling embodied in these two pictures because in the first one you have clearly the guy on top who has the perfect right and ooh, I, there's nobody complaining or anything about that this guy on top this one person is allowed to listen to everybody or at least everybody in his palace but um, and the other is kind of more uh, democratic because the idea in this whole panopticon thing is, or one of the ideas connected to it, that there's not just one guy sitting in the tower in the middle watching everybody else, but that all the people that are not actually inmates in the cells are allowed to come in and do the watching for the watchers. So the idea is that there would be no tyranny possible because all that is watched is if the rules are actually followed. The rules, of course, are not questioned, and everybody can make sure for themselves, can drop by and can do the watching and can make sure that the rules are being followed. Yeah, most don't really seem to have any notion of the idea of privacy that could be violated here. It just doesn't, doesn't really appear. So I thought there was a long history of that, that this whole idea of, of a panopticon was actually much, much older than most people who are interested in it assume today. And I found out, no, it, in the 16th century or in the 17th, it would probably not have made sense to anybody to have a building like the panopticon because the whole idea of 
government and rule and what powerful people like to do and like to know and want to, you know, want to be capable of was uh, very different from just 100 years later and from today. Yeah. So, that's it. So um, we have, uh, well, we've got loads of time for questions. So uh, um, if uh, folks have questions, do we have, do we have any more mics uh, <laughs> available? Yeah. So if you could put your hand up, uh, if you've got a question, and uh, um, I don't, I don't know your name. Sorry. Helmut. Sorry. Helmut. Hel and Helmut here will give you the mic, and you can uh, ask uh, Una, who will, no doubt, provide a, a brilliant answer. One here. One question is, um, those things you told about the acousticum, mm -hmm. are these things that at that time were considered seriously, or was that more like a, a, a fantasy, like, you know, the Wired uh, magazine about the flying car at that time? Well, the line between series and entertainment wasn't as straight as it is today. So Kirche was a very highly regarded person. He was very... His books were actually read by, I mean, he, he got the um, Imperator, whatever, the Emperor, he got the Emperor to be his patron, and he wouldn't have gotten that level of patronage if people were thinking, oh, you know, this Kirche guy, he's still down there, we won't be bothered. And the whole... That the point that something was wonderful or mysterious was actually something that made it scientific in Kircher's mind, because that meant there's something to be found out. And there were other people, I mean, the, the Royal Society later, they, they took up Mersenne and Kircher's works, and they tried to repeat all the, the experiments he described. So he was read, people were interested, and tried to follow up on it. Okay, other questions? Oh, um, gentleman here and then that um, fellow there. At, at that time, the idea of truth was already installed in scientific community, I, I think, where well, it's starting mm -hmm. to at least. So um, um, why do you think he just um, stated things that were obviously not true, although his whole work uh, is part of a community where you had to experiment and prove what you're saying already? Well, I think by the time he started out, and he was planning most of his books really early in the, six, in the 17th century. So by the time, like by 1640, he actually already had a plan for what he wanted to publish for the rest of his life. And a lot of the material as well. And for him, the line between something he experimented himself and something somebody he trusted told him wasn't that important. And also for him, because some of the fantastical stories came from very highly regarded sources and he was trained in this whole um, scholastic tradition that had a lot of weight for him. So it wasn't necessarily obviously wrong to him, and also, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a thing about uh, the vacuum, where apparently he really made uh, the experiment himself with um, quicksilver in, in, in a glass tube and put it on his uh, head and had a little bell in, in the glass tube and struck the bell, and he still heard it. And he concluded from that that the vacuum doesn't exist and isn't possible, among lots of other things that he concluded. And the experiment, how he performed it, it's entirely reasonable if you still hear uh, the bell and you think the bell needs air to be heard, that, well, vacuum doesn't exist. What he didn't know was that the sound transmission was probably not through air in, in the glass tube, but through the hinge on which the bell was hanging. So he said, I made this experiment, vacuum doesn't exist, he's wrong, but he's entirely reasonably wrong. Um, but 
there is a thing about him that he doesn't seem to be care about consistency much. So sometimes he comes upon a phenomenon that doesn't fit the old explanation he's given a couple of pages before, and what he does is he cites the old explanation, but he doesn't say, well, I said that a couple of pages before, but what he says is some people believe that, but as we can see, this explanation doesn't work, so now I am giving you the right explanation. So it's contradictory, but he doesn't care. Nice. Um, and we'll take a question from um, the outside world. Yeah, I'm asking a question from the IRC network. And the question was, were there any pre-plans to make a full duplex connection? So like uh, back and forth? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the technology like this is back and forth in a way. I mean, the, the, the elliptic thing is duplex. Okay. It's just by the way how it, yeah. Okay, this uh, fellow over here, and... Uh... So, listening to your talk, one thing that struck me was actually, even though his technology was wrong, um, there are very striking parallels between the applications um, that he was trying to um, present and basically what we've evolved to today, like the um, how many governments and how many people have bugged offices, um, um, how we all listen to our iPods or whatever so that we don't have to have musicians handy to listen to music, all of these things. Are there, um, was he inventing the applications or is there something that predated him, his applications or was he inventing those and it just took considerable amount of time for the technology to catch up? Well, it, much of this he really didn't invent. He claims he invents it, but um, for the speaking tubes, I mean, the, the uh, more megaphone-like ones, they are probably at least a century older, just not written about and just not written about by people accepted as scholars. And then Bacon already says that something like this exists, but he doesn't describe it in detail. Um, and, well, I don't think he actually invented anything that worked the way he described it. The, the whole thing with the elliptical sound reflection is that he didn't invent it. He knew there were buildings that functioned like that, and he was just the first guy to explain why it works that way. Um, but, yeah, a friend of mine said that, oh, probably Kirche just wanted to have a radio and... Huh? Actually, I have a question. Is there any evidence that he ever went to uh, uh, Turkey? Because uh, Hagia Sophia um, has that elliptical form and is, is you know, very, very, very old and is acoustically you know, uh, extraordinarily effective. No, no evidence, nothing like that. Okay. It's just, it's just that that's very old yeah. in, indeed. Uh, do we have any, any other questions? Stunned silence. <laughs> wow, you've managed to bludgeon the crowd into, uh, into, into silence. So, uh, um, I guess, uh, um, do we have any other questions from uh, the IRC network? No? Okay. Well, oh. if anybody actually wants to look at Kirche's book himself, it's uh, completely in very high resolution on the internet uh, at the Echo Project. It's probably better you just jot down the Echo Project and Kirche then, you know, try to type the link, but, and, yeah, other books. Okay. Oh. Great. So, uh, um, big hand, please, for uh, Una. And if anyone wants to put uh, their musicians in a dungeon later, um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be arranging that for you uh, shortly.